Welcome in everybody. This is part two of my series with Simon Dixon. Simon, again, thank you for making the time. I know you are extraordinarily busy, tied up doing so much. Um, and, you know, getting straight out of the gate, you're doing this for obvious reasons. You are a 5% stakeholder in Celsius. You have tokens, Bitcoin, etc., on Celsius. And you are trying to do what's best for all creditors. Fair to say? Uh, yeah, that's the exact the exact situation. And um, amongst all of that, um, there's conflicts of interest. So I'm just trying to disclose those interests and those that uh, think I'm aligned with their vision. I'm just trying to, you know, let people know that there, there is self-interest. That's what the situation is. Um, and here's what I'm doing about it. <laughs> exactly. Because a lot of, a lot of, you know, people should never, I've always said, I never trust anybody, not even if you think it's your mother on the phone. It's always been my agenda. And getting back to brass tacks, we were all conned by the master con man. I, I don't think I started talking to Alex Mashinsky because I was urged by the community to do that uh, until like, I think it was July 2021. And by that stage, they already had a hole in their balance sheet. And when I go back over history and I see all the clips and all the stuff that's been posted on the web and listening to the bankruptcy lawsuit and all the documentation, I went from kind of being at the acceptance stage to the bargaining stage and dealing with it in my own head. And now I've flipped into the anger stage uh, after viewing everything from the past. Um, how are you dealing with this? What would your stage be? And I know you're going through multiple stages right now with your father passing and everything else, but how are you coping? Yeah, so my father passed and Celsius suspended withdrawals on the same day. Um, and then I had to um, deal with that. And we released that web page that it, it, it feels like a year ago, but it was only like five, five weeks ago or something that we did a show together. Yep. Um, and um, really those processes are also coincide with the three proposals that I um, listed on that website. Um, if you remember, proposal one was save Celsius, do what we did with Bitfinex. Um, at that stage, I thought there was a company worth saving. Um, and uh, when we didn't get the disclosure that we needed in order to save Celsius, it moved to phase two, uh, which was proposal two was find a bunch of investors um, and squeeze some of the, the gap because I realized this is not illiquid, this is insolvent. Um, at that stage, I started telling people, this is insolvent, um, this is going into bankruptcy, um, and got massive amounts of accusations from really upset people that thought I'm, um, you know, fudding them and, and ruining the value of their token and um, all sorts of stuff. And um, so you, you had all these different people that had different interests um, and, uh, you know, were experiencing different levels of emotions. At this stage, most people were you know, really affiliated with the vision of what they had been sold by Alex and uh, the, 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 the financial freedom that they'd achieved from this company in their mind that is now locked up in this app. Um, and uh, as I started to expose some of those things, um, I then moved to phase three, which is the anger phase. Um, when I started to look past and people started to share more and more video footage and um, you know, I wasn't there to watch all of these AMAs every week, but the community was. Um, and uh, they started sharing me how, how things were represented. So um, if you'll, you'll notice, if, if you go back to the history, the, the stage when I moved to three, proposal three, uh, was when I said, look, I'm done with Alex. This, this is a complete mess, misrepresentation. Uh, there's big problems here. There's potential of frauds. Um, I'm hearing all sorts of things of what happened with the sell token um, and just started piecing it together and realized there is no future for Celsius. There's no future um, for the CEO. Um, and uh, so I started going to proposal three, which was um, what needs to happen to this business in order to try and implement a bail-in um, and uh, have something that actually recoups some of the value so that now that we know everybody's going to lose a lot of money in this, um, how do we make the most of a really shitty situation? Um, so those those phases that you've been through, it's all been documented on Twitter and our videos, and um, you can see the different levels of emotions that that we've been through, and it's been a roller coaster. Um, so it's fascinating to come back here, but now I'm just at the the solution stage. Whereas here's the problem: we know the situation. The most of the community know that they've been duped. Um, and, uh, you know, 
the the people in Celsius know that they're in serious trouble. Um, and now how can we make the most out of a bad situation? So that's where my head's at now. Awesome. Uh, well, not awesome, but awesome that you are trying to find solutions, help everybody find solutions, and you are working tirelessly, and we appreciate that. Uh, getting back to that last time we met two weeks ago, we, I spoke about trust, and it's clear that anybody in the in, inner circle of any company, there's always that inner circle, it's clearly they're all fraudsters. They knew something was up. It's impossible to hide a hole this big. Um, it's clear they were aware of a Ponzi scheme that to keep on bringing money in to fill the hole. And that was uh, made clear by a guy called Jason Stone. So it's also clear that the band, brand can never be trusted again. And how are they not in jail? My question is, how is Alex still running the ship, driving the bus, whatever you want to call it? Uh, well, it's a legal process. And so, you know, there are, um, there's a corporate veil and, and a company has what's known as limited liability. Um, so there is a corporate process. Um, and then there is an individual process and determining who's made, the, who made those crimes, um, how severe, how severe they are, you know, what, what about the intent? Um, you know, from my perspective, I still believe that, um, uh, you know, Alex got in over his head, um, didn't have the full comprehension of what it's like to run a financial services company um, and what it's like to have a compliance team where, you know, in, in our company, <clears throat> I'm the CEO, but if there's a record of me ignoring the compliance concerns, uh, I, I know that I can't ignore that because that's on a record, there's a ledger, it goes to the regulator, and if I'm if it's on a record that I ignored that, then um, I know there's serious consequences to that. So, within a financial services company, you have a compliance team that can, um, you know, although the CEO and the board have the ultimate decision, there's a governance process when you're dealing with people's money. Clearly, none of that um, was respected. Um, now, is that a, it, it, what what levels of crime is there? There's the market manipulation. There's all the sell tokens that were the buy walls, there's misrepresentations, all of this is going to play its way out. Um, and, uh, you know, at this stage, we're in a situation where, um, you know, uh, there's lawyers representing a company, which is a, a particular agenda, um, limit the liability, get everybody to settle, um, pay them off, whatever you need to do. Um, there's individuals that all have their lawyers, and they'll be trying to combine those strategies of um, how do you manage all of these conflicts of interest? Uh, then there's regulators, then there's law enforcement, um, and now it's just one ginormous spaghetti junction of mess that um, uh, it needed to just go into bankruptcy to just get that transparency um, and then determine, <clears throat> you know, who's in charge here now? Well, um, you know, we've got to go through a committee. Uh, the committee um, is going to be pitch solutions, then the court sign off. How much influence do various people have? Who owns the private keys? Um, where is that information? Um, that all needs to be worked through now. And that's why he's still around um, until eventually he he won't be around. Um, and then I just leave it to regulators and lawyers and justice to figure out what happens next. Good. Okay. You triggered two, two new follow-on questions from what you just said there. First one is he got in over his head or over his skis or whatever the term was. Is it kind of like a gambler goes to a horse track or something and loses a bit and then loses again? So I can make this up and keeps betting more and more, trying to dig himself out of the hole. Do you believe that's kind of what happened? He started out with good intentions, but just got in too deep too fast. And then it became an obsession because of ego. Yeah, I mean, um, if you if you look at the history of Ponzi schemes, um, few of them actually start with somebody saying, I'm going to create a Ponzi scheme. Uh, most of them start with um, a, a desire to um, create something, something goes wrong, and then they try and cover that up. And then that covering up becomes bigger and bigger problem. And suddenly, um, you're in a situation where the, the, the state of Vermont is claiming that you're in a Ponzi scheme. Uh, that's what I think happened. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, and, and that's where we are. And um, but you know, the, the constant lies and the constant misrepresentations is, is what will determine um, you know, the end result, I think. Yeah. Okay. So if we look at the current leadership team, if they were all kicked out, what would the stewardship look like of the remaining company? Or 
how would they shore that up? Because what you did say made a lot of sense. You need people to there to unravel the spaghetti and only the insiders can figure that out. But at what stage would new stewardship come in and what would they look like? Uh, well, the, you know, there's legal counsel. Um, so now essentially the bankruptcy process is in charge. Um, there is a board. And if you lie under bankruptcy, you know, that's a serious crime. Um, and, uh, you know, so, the, the, you, you know, there's this, it, it, I, I did say at one stage Celsius were in the situation and Alex was in the situation where what is the what is the most serious crime and what is the least serious crime and which one do we commit first? Should we use client money in order to pay off these loans? Um, you know, should we um, move money around in order to limit this exposure? Uh, and uh, or should we uh, break regulations in order to try and save depositors? Uh, and, you know, and all of these, uh, these uh, which which crime is the worst? And, and that's where it is right now. And that's where um, uh, we, we are really. Okay, yeah. and in terms of, uh, but I think I think eventually it does have to reach that stage where um, Alex is no longer fit and proper to to do this, and I think you know the bank process is the best way of getting through that. Yeah, in terms of uh, some nitty gritty, all the stuff that's coming to the surface all at once, uh, every single thing that pops up triggers more questions. But if you look at the custody, the urn and the collateral, did they commingle all this stuff up together? There was talk of about 180 million being set aside for the custody, but nobody's really sure. What's your take on that? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think that there's just this big pot of money um, that got in regulatory challenges um, and then solutions were put together in order to deal with the fact that they never got the licenses they needed in the first place. Um, so, you know, uh, I, I talk about three things uh, and we, one of them is you need to change the leadership. Um, the brands can't be done. There's too many lawsuits. Uh, the second is the risk model. And then the third is the regulations. When you look at all of this commingling of funds, essentially, um, you know, it started with that peer to peer model that we discussed. Then it became a spaghetti junction of different types of yields through a, through what should have been a security. Then money went missing, which turns it into a, a fractional reserve bank. Um, and then regulators come along and say, hey, you're not allowed to sell securities to um, you know, non-accredited US investors. So they then say, okay, well, how do we deal with that? Well, we silo off what's called custody. Um, and uh, custody is also another regulated activity. So you need the lending license, you need the securities license, you also need the custody license. And then if you're doing swaps, you need everything that an exchange has and the money service business licenses. And so every time they came up with a new solution, they created a new problem for themselves. Um, and the cold hard reality is that um, I believe they implemented solutions while growing at the speed of light without having the, the financial systems and controls in place. And that that is, you know, I'm, I'm, it's easy to kick someone while they're down, but the, the, the speed at which they grew is incredibly challenging because Alex was so good at misrepresenting what this is and getting more people to take their pensions, their savings accounts, their life savings, their children retire, you know, um, college funds and put them into Celsius. Um, and uh, so when you, when you have these different services, you know, you've got um, the earned service, which is a security. So that needs to be sold in compliance with securities laws. You've got the collateral that's being locked up in order to issue a loan. That's a consumer lending license. And then you've got custody, which um, actually is meant to be the, the customer has legal title over those assets. That's treated differently, um, you know, because it's, it's a different line on a balance sheet and, and finances. Um, and from all I can see, uh, that was just, you know, uh, that was just pushed into one pool of money. And then when, um, you know, before this went into Chapter 11, uh, this was just, uh, you know, just trying to recoup as much funds as possible, figure out where the hole was. And clearly there just wasn't different pockets of finance, uh, of money that belonged to different people. It was just, um, uh, you know, what uh, uh, they own the private key. How do we get these smart contracts unraveled? How do we figure out what the size of the hole is? And then we, now we need to um, disclose all the crime. Yeah. And the other thing that's actually really upset a lot of people lately is huge salaries continue to be paid to the leadership team and staff and everything else. And that's going to burn a lot in the actual money they have in their balance sheet. 
And I was laying awake last night. I was thinking, well, considering they're all kind of complicit, why not pay the employees with sell token? Considering there's a six hundred million dollar value of sell token on the balance sheet instead of cash. I mean, what are they doing? Yeah. What's your ta- what's your take on that? And is is the bankruptcy court aware of this? I mean, there should be some rules in place to stem the bleed yeah, because the, there's no income coming in. Sure. The ugly the ugly part of this process is really a moral dilemma. Um and you you really face the the cold hard reality that um, in order to get an effective, um, you know, result for this, you do need staff. Um, and those staff have a choice right now. They're all, they all worked for the company where they were duped as well. They got paid a part of their salary and sell token. Their funds are locked up. Um, they feel completely betrayed by their, um, you know, by their leadership as well. Um, and, uh, these are, some of them might be highly skilled people. Others might be underqualified. You know, there's lots of different thoughts on that. Um, but they now have a face, they have a, to face a choice. Do I stay and try and do the right thing? Um, or do I go get another job? Um, and, uh, you know, am I willing to, um, I've, those people have suffered huge financial loss as well because their funds are, are locked up in the sell app and those tokens are worthless and it's just, one big ginormous mess um and it's easy to jump on the obvious which is of course they should um you know be not depleting um funds um but at the same time you need these um you need these people in order to unravel the mess and unfortunately the real horrible part of the of these processes um is that uh you know it, it's going to cost a lot and it's going to be uh you know in order to protect um Alex's position and the company's position, uh, you get these real perverse uh, types of incentives where it works against the depositors, the creditors, um, and uh, you can end up just chewing through an incredible amount of money. All the lawyers are incentivized in order to um, get their chunk of that. And it's, it's just a, it's just not a nice process. Yeah. Okay, let's switch gears and talk about the Chapter 11 process and give people some hopefully some insight as to who's running the show, et cetera. Chapter 11 does appear to be the best hope for success for customers, creditors. Would you agree at this stage of the game? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of chapter 11. Um, cause if you look at, um, other bankruptcy proceedings, it's just automatic liquidations. Um, so the, the parent company of Celsius was a UK co. If this went into UK bankruptcy, um, all of the assets just would have been sold. It would have created cascading liquidations. It would have um, caused issue for the mining business. Um, it would expose more exchanges that are probably operating off insolvency, those unregulated exchanges, um, large withdrawal requests. Um, and while all of that needs to happen, um, liquidation would have pushed it all into that. Now, Chapter 11 is a, is a really interesting process uh, because you do actually get to use real innovation and find the best solution. Um, And those that have been most affected make up a committee, which is the creditors that um, have the largest claims. Uh, And they get to be a part of um, solutions. And those solutions can be, um, unfortunately, they engineered it, whereby um, Alex gets and and Celsius get an exclusivity of 120 days. Um, But that can be overturned if it's proved that um, Alex is just not fit and proper for the role. Um, and that goes through its own process. And in the meantime, others can prepare solutions. So full disclosure, uh, we're preparing a solution um, and uh, we're, we're working through that. Um, and chapter 11 is one of the, the most interesting processes um, that eventually we, you know, the best, the best plans and the best solutions are looked at the committee. Um, and then it goes to the court and the court determines whether this is compliant, whether it's feasible, and what's the fastest way this is there the what's the maximum amount of capital that's been injected into that plan um and it's just an interesting process good in terms of who you know joshua susberg sounds very sus as you probably know what i mean i think it's a british term are you familiar with joshua susberg uh, i'm not no enlighten me he's the lawyer that's representing uh the voyager team and alex recruited them as well and he is arguing that Celsius customers never owned their crypto in the first place. Credit to CoffeeZilla for that one. Uh, what do you think about that argument? It's as if, obviously, 
Alex needs to find the best pit bull to defend him. And I was just wondering if you knew anything about this Joshua Sussberg fellow, because he's definitely uh, yeah, not aligned so, um, with our interests. Oh, definitely not. So, um, you know, you gotta, you gotta look back. Um, this is a tale as old as time. Um, before I got into Bitcoin, I was trying to educate people that when you deposit your money at a bank, you don't own that money. The bank owns that money. They can spend it as they choose. And, um, it tends to get inflated to decrease its value. Um, and uh, essentially they're saying that um, Celsius is an unlicensed bank and the terms and conditions state that you don't own that money. Now, the interesting thing about this is that creates another crime, which is being an unlicensed bank. Um, terms of service is one thing. Um, and uh, so, I, I, you know, these are going to get bashed around in the court. Um, and there's no doubt about it. Um, I, I got some lawyers on the panel. I've been doing lots of AMAs on my YouTube channel. We're getting lawyers to... Um, and they know these people and they're just saying, you know, that is the best lawyer that money can buy to protect your ass. So Alex is using um, our funds in order to pay for the best lawyer that money can buy in order to um, limit um, the, the end result that we get out of this. So that's just the dynamics. And I was trying to help understand that, um, unfortunately, uh, it is depositors first versus Alex first. And Alex is looking out for his family, his children, um, limiting the amount of time or the likelihood of um, all of those consequences. And uh, that's just the cold, hard reality. So once we know that, then it's Game of Thrones. Wow. And in terms of uh, this creditor committee, another question that probably pops up a lot, uh, a lot of people that will be selected for this credit committee are people that hold a million dollars plus. And that triggers concerns in my mind and perhaps many others for us mere plebeians. Will it be the deep, deepest pockets that are satisfied first in this process? Or do you think it'll be fairly handled and equitable, whether you've got $100 in there or $100 million? Uh, my understanding is that the bigger, you know, the bigger the creditor you are, the more likely you are to um, fight for what um, you believe is right for you. Um, and so I think economics matter. I do think that they're looking for a broad range of representations from different parts of the ecosystem. You know, you've got you've got people that feel shafted by the sell token. You've got people that feel shafted by earn. You've got people that feel shafted by their loans. You've got people that feel shafted by their collateral. You've got people that feel shafted by their custody. Um, shareholders don't get a seat at the table, but... Um, you know, we essentially, um, our shares have just been wiped out is the assumption that we're working off from here. Um, but you've got the Series B preference shareholders as well that are looking for a seat at the table. Um, but genuine, the, the, the design of the process is meant to be that the creditors uh, get are getting represented. Um, and so the larger, the larger the deposit you have, the more likely you are to get a seat at the table is my understanding. Yeah, like the uh, squeaky wheel gets the oil type of thing. And uh, most people, uh, so, so you're sharing a lot of disappointing news so far, uh, but we appreciate, again, it's it's time to, you know, face reality, as it were. So what is the latest estimate of the size of the hole? Is it that 1.1, 1.2 billion, 2 billion, 3 billion? It's like if you add the 1.2 billion, you take out the 600 million of sell tokens, it's probably zero, it's 1.8 billion. Uh, but the market has rallied. Um, where do you, if, if you had to estimate, after what you've just said, where the haircut would be for your typical Celsius, would it be losing half, 60%, 70%, 80%? I know it's an extremely difficult question to put you on the spot, but it began with kind of 20% haircut, then 70%. Now people are talking 60%. Could it be worse than that? At least if people heard, okay, there's a good shot of getting 60%, it'll give people some comfort that there is some hope. And I think people do need a little bit of that comfort right now. What would you say? Yeah, so um, there's so many moving parts. Uh, so let me help you try and understand some of the moving parts. So the first thing is um, everything's been disclosed in dollars. Um, so I don't think in dollars. Um, obviously, um, you know, as a, a medium of exchange, it's, hel it's helpful to think in dollars. I I still don't know what the value of 0.012678939 Bitcoin is in my head. I still think in dollars. Um, but I know how many Bitcoins I had at Celsius. Um, and if I end up with less Bitcoins, I really don't care about what the dollar value is. 
Um, and so you've got these different people that are thinking in stable coins as well. And so if you're thinking in stable coins, they proposed a solution whereby if the market recovers, the dollar value of those assets go up and therefore you might be recouped. But someone like me who's thinking in Bitcoin, it doesn't matter what the market does. I just want um, to get the, the most amount of Bitcoin back. Um, and so you've got these conflicting parts. So the dollar value is a moving target. Um, you've got the sell token and uh, people were asking me, how would you value the sell token in a recovery plan? And I put the question out to people, well, how would you value the sell token? 90, uh, um, from the analysis that I've seen, 93% of the sell tokens are in the app. Um, and there's 7% floating around on exchanges between short sellers and people speculating. Um, if those uh, withdrawals were open, what would be the value of those tokens? Well, my guess it would be a race to sell. Um, and there's virtually nothing. Um, so then you've got different thoughts. Well, is well, they were sold on a promise that this is almost like equity. Um, so you've got those ICO investors that are thinking, I bought them at 20 cents and 30 cents. Um, and so how do you value those assets? Well, they just slapped 600 million on them. Um, I'd say you've got to assume those are worthless <clears throat> um, to get that. So that turns 1.2 billion into 1.8 billion. Um, then you've got mining. Um, people are doing calculations on this mining operation. Um, I've been, I, I did mining in 2014 for a few years. Within three years, the operation was worthless. Um, it used geothermal power in Iceland. It was as efficient as it gets, using the best equipment with the best operators out there. Um, and it is a ginormous cash burn, requires constant reinvestment. People are calculating, oh, it's generating this amount of Bitcoin. Uh, but you've got to sell most of those to pay for the electricity. Then you've got to put some aside to reinvest. It's a very capital intensive business, very low margin um, and uh, an ultra efficient business. So <clears throat> how much is that worth? Uh, well, I, you know, they, they, that would be um, another uh, area to look at. Then remember, we haven't actually been told token by token. Um, what I want to see is, you know, um, how many tokens are there? So how many do you owe? And how many do you have with every single token? Um, then we can build out a model that adjusts with market pricing and you know um, adjusts for liquidity uh, to actually start to think about what the haircut might be. Um, and the creditors are going to have to work through all of these uh, challenges. So it's important to have a really good creditor committee that understands um, some of these um, nuances um, in that. Um, then and only then um, can you look at what, what a haircut might be. So you, you then got to look at, well, that depends upon the actions that happen from here. If it turns out that they're going to do liquidations of a chunk of those assets, um, that's going to crash the market further. That's also going to impact the mining business um, because the mining business will become maybe unprofitable. Uh, so you've got to have some really skilled operators in, judge, in, in um, figuring out how to maximize um, the outcome here, um, which to me is you've got to avoid liquidation at all costs. Um, in the mining business, you need to analyze, well, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. Uh, is it easier to just sell the operation and keep Bitcoin without all of the operational cost versus trying to generate Bitcoins and have to capital reinvest? These are all huge business decisions. At the same time, who's competent to do that? Um, and, uh, you know, this is why to me, the only strategy, um, is to, is to, is to try and create a business that works in the future that deals with the three problems that I've identified, um, haircut, you know, um, if it goes into liquidations, I I'd say that there's a potential that this is an 80% haircut. Um, if this is managed well, I think that there's a 50% haircut, but I just don't have enough data. Um, so then what are you going to do with the other 50% um, is the question that I'm asking. Yeah. And it's it's funny. I always called, uh, whether it's gold mining or Bitcoin mining, it's kind of a cutthroat business. And considering how incompetent and dishonest the management team were with pretty much zero experience in mining, what were they thinking? Oh, let's magically mine our way out of this hole, I think was their idea without understanding how competitive the space is. So obviously, again, another misstep that shows you they were out of their depth in many ways. So that was that was good for that uh, a hard truth. Uh, in terms of the recovery plan, you mentioned seats at the table. It's very difficult to unravel the spaghetti. It requires somebody with your type of experience that covers the gamut uh, from crypto, 
mining, going through all your experience with Bitfinex and other players, do you have a seat at the table or is your plan, one of the plans put forward or where does that stand right now? Or do you have any influence in this process? Um, yeah, so uh, I'm in a, a very strange position that I never imagined that I would be in. Um, I've got shares, which I think are worthless now. Um, I've got a deposit, which I'd like to get back, which has put me in, you know, in, uh, right up there with one of the creditors. Um, I've got the ear of the old board and the new board. Um, and uh, I've also got um, the US trustee that's reached out to me and asked me to join the committee the new board that's asked me to join the committee. Um, at the same time, my council is telling me there's certain conflicts. And so um, I've got all of these different people that are requesting different things from me. Um, and I'm just trying to skillfully manage all of those conflicts of interest. I know that I've got value to bring to the table. Uh, but at the same time, I still feel that the key value that I have is a proposition that might, on a very high risk, high return proposition, um, make a nice story at the end of this, where we all um, where we all can can have one glimmer of hope, of celebrating like we did with Bitfinex. Um, and so um, I've just disclosed that the U.S. trustee reached out to me, said join the committee, the board did. Um, so I've applied. My lawyers told me here's how you manage those conflicts, but you can still apply. Um, and so the U.S. trustee will decide whether I should be on that table or not. Um, and, uh, I've also got, um, you know, um, plans that I believe that will, um, that will give us a hope that there is something at the end of this. Uh, exactly. so I don't really know how to answer that. The hand is, uh, it's in, it's in the eyes of the U S trustee to figure out what to do with that. I've just put as many cards on the table and disclosed as much and, and they can figure out what the right way forward is. And I fully expect, cause I know you are involved in so many different things. You might be NDA to death. So this might be the last time we're able to talk about this stuff. Is that fair to say? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so what I sign, um, I'm I'm trying to get it in a position where I can um, still communicate, um, but not reveal the information that's under NDA. I would still like to uh, try and be a voice to reassure people um, that, you know, because I think part of what went really wrong with Celsius is, was just the deafening silence. Um, and, uh, you know, that was a really traumatic experience for many people. And then they went through these different stages of grief, you know, where they were denial, they were anger, they, you know, all these different phases that you talked about. Uh, and the silence was really bad. So I'd, I'd like to try and maintain the ability to have some kind of voice. Um, and uh, even if it's just coming on and saying, look, um, you know, uh, these are the things I can't talk about. These are the things I can talk about, but I might need to go silent at some stage and, um, just reassure that I'm sticking to my original manifesto that I published, which is depositors first. Um, and uh, I do believe that um, the only way to plug the haircut, um, you know, I'm not going to do the hard work of saying what the haircut is. It's Celsius's mess. They can do the hard work of saying what the haircut is. I'm not going to be trolled and bullied and everyone accuse me of... Um, you know, shafting them over. That's Celsius's problem. But once I know what the haircut is, um, then I think I've got something that we could um, use using equity um, to try and plug some of that and just try and take some of this um, mess and turn it into something that we could build together and, and try and build a, a hope. And, and that triggers a question because, you know, hope is never a strategy, but in some situations, it's good to have a glimmer of it. So for those who do not have a time frame concern and want to get as close to 100% back versus a haircut, what would you do? I think I know the answer already, but what would you recommend the average person to do as well? Answer it from those two perspectives. Yeah, so there's um, there's there's three different solutions that I believe are going to be put to the table and maybe some person, you know, um, in the shadows that's going to come up with another solution and we'll see. Um, the first one is settle. Um, why would you settle? Well, maybe you just need the cash um, and maybe you just don't want the risk. Maybe this has just been all too much for you um, and uh, I, I wouldn't judge you for settling. Some people literally can't pay for food and feel, you know, that this is like the end of their life because they've the these um, they don't know how to confront um, people in their family and tell them that they've lost the money and uh, various other things. So that's one decision. Um, and uh, you know, I believe that there will be a settlement. Um, what does that mean? It means that you'll sign a contract agreeing not to sue. 
um, they'll send you some money and you may decide that, okay, I've, this is just all too much for me. Um, the second is what they're calling crypto long. Um, I, I don't, I don't, if you're a stable coin depositor, then crypto long might be play a long term game. Um, and then the dollar value of those cryptos in a recovery market um, and some of those Bitcoin might make you whole. If you're a crypto depositor, then you're not going to be made whole because uh, the market's going to recover um, and uh, those those tokens going up in value, unless you're investing in the hedge fund, which is unregulated to do, then regulators are just going to shut this down. So I don't see that as a, as, as a viable um, solution. Um, and so the third solution um, is, we, you know, there's a hole. Let's just get everyone the assets that they have. Um, those that want out, they can they can get out. Um, and those that want to stay on this journey, let's put together a long term um, equity position that solves some of the three key things that has a business. The first is leadership that has experience and is able to be regulated. And um, the second is risk management. Um, and I'm putting forward that uh, this should you should you shouldn't have these massive amounts of altcoins and cascading risks. Um, you should just have Bitcoin manage the volatility risk and dollar back stable coins. Um, a new risk model, which is significantly smaller um, than, you know, maybe that's only 10% of the size of the business that we knew before. Um, and uh, grow that just based upon sound principles. Um, and then um, thirdly, um, put together all the licenses to be able to do this in a regulated environment. Um, and so I put together um, jurisdictions that are looking to support this. Um, we have the security side. Um, we have work. We've got a company that um, has all the the lending licenses side. Um, roll that all together, um, and uh, let's just uh, two hundred thousand of us all become um, shareholders using the Chapter Eleven exemption from issuing securities, um, and just create an incredible company and see if we can build it together. And then maybe in five to ten years, um, or. Uh, you know, less, uh, we can create something that's, um, well, you know, I, I like to be, uh, underestimate there rather than overestimate. Um, but within Bitfinex, it, it was um, the, the ability to get a, a high return based on the high risk. Uh, let's do that again. And let's see if we can pull this together in a fast way. So, and would this plan also involve kind of a call option on the future of Bitcoin price? Um, so what well, well, is is equity and equity is combining securities, combining um, potentially some of the mining uh, business and combining debt markets. And we got a whole business plan that we were working on. You know, prior to this, we were working with countries that, um, you know, El Salvador that wanted to do, um, you know, bonds and uh, Bitcoin backed bonds and various other things. Um, I think that there's an amazing market just for dollar backed stable coins and Bitcoin um, from individuals that want to have, um, you know, yield in their retirement plan and companies that want to implement a Bitcoin standard in their company um, and countries that want to um, implement, a, you know, a legal tender and Bitcoin bond market. Um, and uh, we'll apply for all the licenses and we'll roll this all together and achieve three years worth of work in a few months and see if we can um, put that to the courts and show this is the best way of returning value. Yeah, very, very good. <laughs> it's all great what you're saying. Now let's change gears and talk about um, kind of proof of claim. There's so much confusion out there with what people should do. Uh, there was emails out from Celsius, etc. cetera. Um, typically, what I've been saying to people is really think what you've been saying too is take a snapshot screenshot of what you have in your Celsius account right now, download a CSV file, fill out the form. The form apparently is flawed. They're updating a new one with Stretto. Do you think it makes a difference if people do the Stretto process or not, or file? You know, what, what would you recommend as the easiest go forward now? And if people do not file, does that mean they're left out in the cold compared to others that do file? Uh, no, my understanding, and I, I did um, do some AMAs on, on my channel and get some lawyers to actually answer those questions and some bankruptcy experts to answer those questions. The first thing is the very challenging thing is just like when we say not financial advice, we have to say not legal advice, because if it turns out that filing or not filing gives you a financial loss, then we can't be held responsible for that. So we can only say the information that we have um, and, you know, um, people will come back and blame us later. So 
we, you just can't act upon this advice. Um, I can tell you what I think, and from what people have been telling me, um, that Celsius has all the data. There is a database that has all that. Um, and uh, they're just asking you for submit some forms. And in previous bankruptcies, that form was inappropriate because you don't, it's not just a dollar value. There's some Bitcoin, there's some ETH, there's some link, whatever you had. And so this new form will come out. Um, my understanding is that you file those forms and it's not going to be consequential. Um, but you should, you should ask a lawyer um, because only a lawyer that you've engaged to give you legal advice can you hold accountable if there's financial loss from that decision. Um, but the, the what I've been told is this inconsequential. You sh you know that um, you can file those. Um, I filed the claim forms. I filed mem um, committee forms. Um, but I think they'll have all that data anyway. It's just to match it up to see whether the database is different from what you're claiming. Um, and uh, that's that's my understanding of the process. Okay, very good to hear. And if again. When it comes to uh, Europeans, I know you've got a lot of Europeans in your audience, and I do too. A lot of people are concerned that they'll be treated differently, or people in Asia, or people in India. What's your take on different geographic jurisdictions and how they'll be handled by the U.S. Chapter 11 court? Um, I think that it doesn't make any difference whether what jurisdiction you are in terms of Chapter 11. So just because it's happened in um, the U.S., it doesn't mean they're going to treat anyone differently, is my understanding. Um, I think they will treat everyone the same. Now, if there is securities involved, then it has to comply with securities laws, which means that um, the opportunities are treated differently. Now, what's really interesting is uh, I've got our securities lawyers going through the, the certain types of exemptions. And Chapter 11 does have certain exemptions whereby um, if you're just simply issuing equity, it's not a securities offering. Um, now, if you're from Europe, um, you know, we deal with global securities laws. When we're doing an offering in the US, you have um, this difference between accredited and non-accredited. Um, in Europe, you have prospectus directives, and then you have the local jurisdictions that sit underneath Europe as well. Um, and uh, fortunately, we've dealt with this minefield of global securities laws for, for a long, long time now. Um, so we've got the expertise in order to figure out how to do that. Combine that with um, I, I, I really believe that Chapter 11 is just about the best process I've ever seen um, for this. So I think that this really is the, the right environment. Um, I'm amazed by this process because it's so um, innovative compared to other jurisdictions. Um, and uh, I, I think that we can, you know, a model can be created here. And it's really interesting that we're, flashing, we're fleshing out all these issues, right? We're doing live AMAs. And uh, we're saying, well, how should sell be priced? And everyone can give all that feedback. And then that feedback's being consolidated. That's going to make its way up to the committee. Then the committee are going to go up with a proposal. And then lawyers and regulators are going to say, well, you can't do this. Um, and then eventually a case is going to have to be made. So I really think that this is crowdsourcing um, you know, the best result. And I believe that the community is going to be able to come up with the best result. And the technology exists. So everybody just engage as much as possible. Um, this is going to be a community effort to, to turn this into the best result possible. Um, and I think that, that that is just fascinating. I've never seen that before, um, that we just happen to be in, in this scenario. And Chapter 11 is the process uh, that can facilitate that with the goal of personally avoid liquidations at all costs because liquidations is is the, the the dread pirate robert you know that's the that's the one we really want to avoid so let's use all of the community's knowledge experience expertise uh, and come up with the best result possible with the best people that can execute that um, and turn this into something okay because i'm going to take you back a second because when we were talking a few minutes ago about haircuts and you're saying you know worst case scenario could be 80% loss, best case, maybe 50% loss. But now you're saying the community is there, the chapter 11 process is amazing, and you sound really, really positive. Has your position changed? Or are you still, or were you just sandbagging those two kind of the worst case scenarios? No, you've got, case scenarios? look, you've got ways of plugging this gap, which is firstly, what do you have? Well, you've got what tokens you have. Celsius have lost a bunch of your tokens. There's no way of changing that. OK, um, so then how do you maximize value? Um, so you've got the tokens um, and then you have different mechanisms. You have debt. So, um, you know, the, there could be a loan 
that requires repayment on a future business, or there's equity where you get a stake in the upside. Um, we've got these three different things to juggle and put together in the best way. And if we can get um, a result for that and the time frame is realistic, um, then there's an opportunity in a high risk, high return environment to make back um, funds. Um, if, if you're talking about what is the current situation, the current situation is not good. There's a there's a company that's lost a lot of your a lot of your funds. Um, there's a lots of lawsuits and lots of claims, um, and there's a there's a, a mountain of regulatory hurdles to overcome. Um, so the way that you consolidate these two things is this is the situation. Let's face up to that. Um, now, what are the different options in order to produce a result? Um, and how much risk does one want to take? And let's not say it's linear. Let's say those that just want to get out, get out. Okay, that's fine. Maybe we can find an investor that wants to buy your claim um, and you can take that haircut and get out. Maybe there's people that want to take a lot of risk. Um, and so let's just, let's just uh, combine these different things put yourself in a category, come up with a few different solutions, uh, and uh, you might lose everything by taking the maximum amount of risk, or you might um, decide I'm just going to, you know, um, take the worst case scenario. Um, and uh, But let's not liquidate everything and create the worst case scenario for the industry, for everyone, because uh, I think we can come up with better than that. Okay, so now, now you're, you're talking about what I would think about a solution, which I think I probably through osmosis picked up from you is you got the people who want to cash pay out ASAP, no matter what it costs, even if it's 20%. And you got the people who's like, Hey, I've got a five year time frame. I don't mind sitting it out. If I can get instead of a 20%, maybe 80% back. And then you got you, you've got behind you people with up to 6 billion in potential commitments. You'd be in a position to hopefully maybe convince the bankruptcy court, Hey, for those who want to get out now, we'll cash them out, but we'll take title to their potential payout down the line. Is that, in simple terms, one of your options? Yeah, and that's exactly what happened with Mount Gox. There were people that couldn't wait, and there were investors that were willing to pay to be patient. Um, and they took a big haircut because they wanted the money now. And then they went along and they said, well, I'm just going to buy my Bitcoin now. And then they rode the whole wave. Um, the important part here is making options, which is, you know, there, there are people that just want no more risk and they're willing to um, get out fast. So there will be a solution for those people. Uh, there'll be a, 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 a speculative solution um, whereby those can, can wait longer. Um, and then there will be a way of plugging the gap through equity. Um, and there'll be investors that are willing to say, well, I'll buy all of those off those people. Um, and, and then you just make your decision. Um, we'll say, you know, here's low risk, here's medium risk, here's high risk. Um, and here's a bunch of investors that are willing to pay for high risk. Um, how much are you willing to, to, to settle for? Uh, and we just put all that together. Good. That's, uh, I think that's what people kind of wanted to hear, kind of their options. And I know some people just want out. Sometimes ripping the Band-Aid off is better and easier, even if it means a bigger haircut. But others are in this for the long haul. And, you know, you have experience with, you know, with the test of time, you can make these things pay back very well if you are patient, which is a key part of what makes a good investor, in my opinion, as well. Not giving any advice here at all. So this this is good. Yeah, um, true. But, but the, the challenge on that is that there are, uh, unfortunately, there are people, the, 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 the tragedy of this situation is that we could tell you how to be a great investor. Um, but the reality is that there are people that are willing to be great investors that they can do that. Um, but the CEO got people to take out their retirement funds, put it in this, uh, and they're not going to be working anymore. Uh, you know, they don't have patience. Uh, they need that money. Um, and so it's not necessarily just, am I an investor? It's life necessity um, has, uh, has, is going to put some people in that situation. So it's, it's a bit more nuanced. It's, it's a bit like the whole, not your keys, not your coin. There's a, there's a bit more to that argument. You know, there, there were people that were duped and misled and, um, uh, they didn't even, you know, understand some of these things and, uh, everyone's going to be wiser out of this, you know, in the next wave of people that go through the next cycle and get scammed because it will happen again. Um, you're going to be the wise ones that are warning them against all these things because you've got the experience. Um, 
And yeah. so, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's everyone's just slightly different. Um, and there's, there's humans behind all these numbers and then, and that's um, important to remember. So any one of my first videos back in early 2021, when I started this, I said, I don't get out of bed for 6%. So I was extremely against rehypothecation and everything else like that. But anyway, hindsight is always 2020 <laughs> and amazing how things change in terms of loans, people with loans, what would you advise them? Those with margin calls. I know the judge said they're not going to liquidate any laws loans. How long do you think that will last? And my old, one of my old theses was never throw good money after bad. But what would you mm. tell people with loans right now? Will the court protect them forever or until there is actually a settlement? Should they be concerned or deal with margin calls? Yeah, so um, the you know the the committee is going to have to work through these um, issues, and there are certain there's there's a list of certain things that need to be worked through. So all these decisions are going to be made in the coming weeks, um, and I don't know which direction they're going to go. And uh, if I tell you a recommendation. Um, you could suffer financial loss based upon that recommendation. So I just, I, I can't, it's a bit like um, people always ask me, oh, when are you going to, when we're applying for a license, when are you going to be there? And I say, I can't second guess the regulators. The regulators can put in spanners in the works. And this is another one of those situations where unfortunately um, this could go in any direction and uh, you, it may work for you putting bad money, you know, uh, money or bad money, um, or it may be the rules that you, you stick to that role. And unfortunately, I can't give you that advice, but we will find out very soon. Okay, good. And then in terms of people, again, with those loans, do you foresee them getting a, I know you probably can't answer this either, but a percentage of their collateral back? Or will there be a no option to pay off the loan? Again, probably still no idea. It's yeah, uh, again, next, I, I reckon in the next couple of weeks, you'll know the answer to that. These all need to be figured out. Great. And in terms of privacy, a lot of people are very, very concerned about privacy, especially if they have kind of big bags and stuff. Is there a way, it's a very, very legal question, and I'm sorry to throw this at you. Is there a way for somebody to preserve their own private identity, personal identity from public view when filing a claim with bankruptcy court? I, I don't actually know the answer to that, um, but my what I'm seeing so far is that as as a creditor, um, if you are a large creditor, then that is meant to be public information because disclosures are meant to be figured out. Now, how they consolidate that with, um, for example, GDPR in Europe, um, and how they consolidate that with new privacy laws that have been written all around the world uh, is really a mind. And this is. This is the, the debate that's been happening. Um, you know, GDPR was put in in order to protect data, um, but at the same time, AML laws do the opposite. Um, which one supersedes? Uh, you know, and, and often laws are put in place that conflict with each other. Uh, so it's, it's a legal minefield um, whether your privacy will be protected or not. Um, the, the process is meant to be designed for transparency. Um, so there's a huge risk that when you use these, um, you know, centralized um, platforms that you're 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 going to be you may be compromised and you should prepare for that. And how strong this is like a, a left field question? Do you believe the bankruptcy court is around giving people their assets back in kind versus cashing them out and giving them cash? Um, again, this 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 really comes down to the committee, um, and that's the importance of the committee. Um, and uh, my guess is that the co the committee, if it's the largest creditors and most of those are depositors, would be extremely against liquidation. So uh, this is the beauty of the process. I can't imagine there being some huge creditors on that committee and that think that the best result is um, liquidations because uh, they just wouldn't have had that balance on Celsius in the first place if they were thinking along those lines. Um, however, if, if an effective solution cannot be reached at, then it will move into liquidity um, and that would just be the end result. Yeah. Awesome. I just uh, did a post in the chat if anybody has any final quick questions for Simon, but I've gone through my agenda. And once again, Simon, I really appreciate all the work you're doing, uh, all the commitment, all the dedication. We know you have skin in the game, but we appreciate as well your transparency and openness. But then again, uh, at the same time, we had people telling <laughs> telling us how transparent they were in the past. But I think anybody can see what you do, what you've been through, and how you're here, and how hard you're working right now, that you are committed to helping others. 
And uh, I, I, I firmly believe that, but I've been, you know, anyway, I'm not going to talk more. I'm going to see if there's any quick questions. Uh, da, 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 da. There's a question regarding from Jason. Can you cover U.S. custodial accounts? Um, I think we covered that at the very beginning, Jason, but uh, there's no additional light. I'll, I'll, give it, I'll give a bit more light on it, though. Um, so um, there was a regulatory, you know, my understanding of it is that um, when the SEC was probing into Celsius's business model and when state regulators were saying these are unlicensed securities that you're selling, uh, they needed to come up with a solution for non-accredited U.S. investors. Um, so they said, well, we'll file for the accredited investors and we'll take the assets that earn, and uh, because that was a security, we'll move it into custody. Um, now, custody is, means that those assets aren't Celsius's. Um, so in the next week or so, or the next couple of weeks, there's going to be a determination about whether those assets were treated as custody. In order to do that, I believe that they're going to have to pile through the database. Uh, they're going to have to do discovery, do a forensic investigation, um, on how Celsius, did they actually move those monies, those money into custody? Um, or was it just this big pot and pool and a, and a bit of a farce and a, uh, you know, a, a regulatory solution that was never implemented correctly? Uh, and that's going to come from that discovery process. It's a big black box. Uh, but if your funds are treated as custody, you own those funds. Celsius doesn't. Um, if it's in the EARN program, then Celsius told you that you essentially it was a bank. Now, whether that's legal or not, uh, there's all these legal issues to figure out. Yeah, people are very appreciative of you, Simon. Tons of kind words for you. They thank you for all that you're doing. And there's a fun question to try and lighten the mood because a lot of people feel after this conversation, they feel less hopeful. Uh, but a fun question before we get to the hope question. This is from Beardy Day. What is your favorite color? Wow, what's my favorite color? Um, oh, we stumped him. We stumped Simon. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, God, I'm so used to talking about finance. When it comes to actually the real world, I don't even know how to answer that question. I see um, a lot I of gold do on like, your I table. Like, I see yeah, gold. I do like blue. Well, you know, um, the, people hate my furniture. Um, my, ha my house is full of this shit. Um, the reason is, is because I hate buying things that go down in value. I... I even when I'm buying furniture, I, I look at art, I look at gold, and people think that I'm like a, a dictator um, or something like that. Um, and uh, I love it. I've just got that bad taste, um, and I think it, I, I like it. Uh, but yeah, you know, I, I just hate buying things. And when it, even when I'm buying things, I want the furniture to, to be a store of value. Um, and I do believe in gold as a store of value as well. Um, but yeah, my favorite color is blue, um, navy blue. I love navy blue. Excellent. Uh, so getting back to the hope thing, uh, there's a lot of different, I'm trying to condense it all down to one simple question. Uh, mm. People feel a little less hopeful from this interview today, which maybe reality sometimes hurts, but there is still hope. But some people feel if they don't have legal representation, are they at a disadvantage? Again, can you throw somebody a little bit of hope here and do they need le legal representation, especially if they can't afford it? What are they going to do? Yeah. Or will the bankruptcy court so, handle everybody fairly? Yeah. So everyone needs to make the assessment of, are my, is my financial loss worth hiring and spending money on lawyers? That's an assessment you need to make. So if you've got $1,000 and you're going to need to spend $2,000 on lawyers, then it's just simple maths. Um, uh, you know, if you've got $10 million and you need to um, get some legal counsel, then your advisor should save you a lot of money. And they should be able to give you, you know, and um, I've uh, I've done AMAs with lots of lawyers that are perfectly capable of understanding this situation. Uh, but what I can say is in the Mount Gox scenario, um, committees were formed, um, you know, unofficial committees, large committees, um, class actions, all sorts of stuff. Um, the community will consolidate around um, people that were going to be the maximum, you know, amount of efficiency um, so that um, uh, represents, you know, in Mount Gox, there was for eight years, this is legal group, um, and they pulled together a bit of money and they assigned someone to be the trustee of that. Uh, all of that will happen. So, um, you know, the, 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 the community is going to get together. We're all in the same boat uh, and there will be lots of groups formed. Um, we created a telegram group. I'll tweet it out after this called Chapter 11 Ideas. 
And it's just 2,000 people all coming up with ideas and crowdsourcing those ideas um, and uh, just focusing on solutions. So I, I know people are not feeling hope, but um, this is our opportunity as a community to figure out the best ideas and implement them. Yeah, and, and in defense of Simon, there's always... There's always, I've discovered, you know, 2%, 5% toxicity sometimes in comments, and I'm sure you've seen your share of that. Um, somebody referred to Simon as a vulture. In, I'm going to try to defend you, Simon, with logic. If you were a vulture, you wouldn't be helping everybody by being so open and public. You'd be secretly filing your own claim with the courts with top attorneys and not trying to fight for everybody. Is that fair to say? And does that represent that you... Yeah, so... Well, if I'm a vulture, okay, so let's let's try that on for size. Yeah. So um, I'm the largest shareholder in a company called Bank to the Future. Um, and uh, if I was a vulture, then what I would what I would do is I do exactly what FTX did. Um, I would put together a secret a secret syndicate of um, people that could write big checks, um, and I would do what JP Morgan did as well in 1907. Yeah. Um, and I'd uh, uh, I'd loan lend money to all these distressed companies, um, and then I'd negotiate as part of the terms that I buy the company for pennies on the dollars, um, and then I'd also put out offers to um, everyone that needs the money um, for you know ten cents on the dollar in order to um, try and uh, uh, to to try and purchase that, and then I'd put all those assets into Bank to the Future. Um, and, uh, but, you know, and then I'd, uh, take advantage of everybody's situation. Um, so let's look at what the opposite of that is. Well, what's the opposite? Um, what I'm doing is I'm saying rather than do that, um, anybody that wants equity, um, and come along beside me rather than what happened where FTX essentially owns BlockFi now, um, why don't we all do that together? Um, and we all get shares. So if you want to be a vulture with me, um, then we all get the same terms. Uh, also, I'd much rather um, get my deposit back and get my Bitcoin back. So um, if you have a deposit, then um, we're, we're vultures together. Um, and so what I'm trying to construct here is, um, is a scenario where our interests are, are aligned. Um, and I'm also, you know, trying to be fair to people that were duped in the, in, from the sell um, token community that have essentially tokens that I believe to be worthless right now. Uh, those people really hate me uh, because I'm because I'm saying things like that. that. Um, and uh, but I'm trying to think what what you, you know if they were misrepresented that they believe that they invested in equity. Um, what's the right way of um, treating those people as well? Um, and without creating market manipulation. So those are the speculating on markets. Um, I don't really have interest in those people. Um, but the people that are actually have tokens in sell, they're a, they're a creditor. They're a depositor. Um, and so, yeah, it just, just me, all I can say is that I have this company called bank to the future and I have 850 shareholders. Um, and my goal is to create business opportunities for that company. Um, I have a bunch of people that invested in shares in Celsius, a thousand people. Um, and they, they're about to find out that their shares are worthless, um, because of the way that Celsius, um, committed this fraud, um, and, uh, or alleged fraud, let's say. Um, and, uh, um, I also have, um, a deposit. So just put all of that together and figure out whether, you, where, where you think I'm, I'm a vulture. Um, and I'll go on YouTube and I've been answering people's questions and, uh, being transparent as much as I can. Um, of course I want to make back as much money as possible. And if you'd like to join me on that journey, um, then align rather than attack. Exactly. And the final question for you, and trust me, 98% of people here appreciate what you do. And I think it's also important though, to hear all voices and challenge all sides. And sometimes the hardest questions bring about the best answers that give people the most comfort. So how can the vultures swarm around Simon and his committee to help you one more time? What can everybody here in the audience do to help, help themselves, help the average customer? creditors, etc. Yeah, just pu push back. You know, I, I'm, I'm not adverse to pushing back. Um, I'm trying to answer as many questions on Twitters and spaces and all of these things. Carry on doing what you're doing, bring up your concerns. Um, and uh, see if you if you don't like the answers, then call me out. Um, I've had to apologize at some paces in this process when I've done things wrong. 
you know, I accidentally retweeted somebody that was, um, uh, you know, um, that was acting a bit more violent than I would have liked. Um, I retweeted it. I was sending out lots of different tweets. Um, and that could have been, and, you know, they were saying, I want my crypto back. And I said, I'm aligned. Um, but in the previous sentence, they were saying things, let's hang Alex or something. Um, and I accidentally tweeted that. I don't condone violence. And I apologize. I said, that's really not what I intended to do. Um, and I made a mistake there. And um, and I, I try to fess up to mistakes. That was a mistake. Um, I don't want violence for that. I'll leave the justice system and the regulators to figure out what's what the right um, action is here. Um, and I'll just be as transparent as I can and align. And um, if I'm acting against your interest, then fight as hard as you can. Get your interest on the committee. Um, rally the community together um, and put together a community of people that are just representing what's important to you. And if I'm against that interest, then then fight as hard as you can against it. I think some people also spoke about the ability to file kind of uh, a motion or some, I, I can't remember what the legal term is called, with the judge of the case. And they read certain things like, hey, I'm in this situation, this happened to me, you know, plead for that. Do you think that is worth time at all other than rallying around you and making people's voices heard? Yeah, I think Aaron everybody Bennett. plays a role. Yeah, I, I think everybody plays a role. And if you're going to put pressure on a, a, you know, if you're going to do lobbying efforts on certain pressure groups, then do what you need to do. And if you can rally a community around that, and that's your value that you bring to this process, um, then fight for what's right for you. Just understand what's important to you, fight for it. Um, and the best ideas are going to win from this process. And the uh, and and we, you know, uh, we there are these different interests, and we all need to to just deal with that. Uh, and people are going to contribute in different ways, and uh, it's worth exploring all these ideas. Some ideas are going to be rubbish, um, some ideas are going to be great, and then the community is going to rally around that idea. Um, and everybody, you know, just build your community around your idea, um, and just focus on solutions rather than than, you know. Um, really just focus on solutions. And that's what I can say. Um, don't allow yourself to fall into a place where you're just focused on all of the problems and you allow that to disable you and cripple you. Um, and I go through those emotions. Obviously, we're humans. Uh, but think about your solution and just rally for it and fight for it and, and just be involved in this process and find allies. Good. Well, sir, I know it's after seven o'clock your time. Once again, the community really appreciates you, your tireless effort working seven days a week. You did a Saturday with me, a Saturday evening. Now it's a Thursday evening uh, during the summertime. But thank you all. And uh, just everybody, please, link uh, is below for Bank to the Future and also Simon's Twitter handle. Make sure you follow him. He is working tirelessly and he's definitely on our side. So big thank you once again, sir. And thank you to the community here as well. Appreciate you all. Okay. Thank you, James. Cheers. Bye-bye.